Can you see that? That is not straight. Um, this is the Z probe off of the Carvera, and as you can see there, the little spindle end piece um, is bent. And I did that uh, on the machine here the other day while running some experiments. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you, focus, I'm going to explain to you how I bent it and also how I fixed that and also how you can avoid bending that in the future. So since the last video uh, that I uploaded, there have been quite a few comments and bits of feedback on the unboxing and first use of the Carvera. Um, I did make a couple of mistakes in that video uh, that I'd like to point out today. One is that during the installation process, there are two screws here and here, uh, and then another in the, in the base here and here that I neglected to install. Um, those do come in a bag inside with the kit and are marked as backup screws. And it is mentioned in the manual, but I somehow kind of glossed over that. So when you go to unbox and build yours, uh, don't forget to put those two, those uh, or four totally uh, screws in per the instructions. Now, since the last video, uh, I've not had a tremendous amount of time to do testing of the machine, but you can see I have done a little bit of uh, V-carve engraving type work. Um, this is using the application called VCarve. I was previously using Fusion 360, but I found it to be kind of clunky for exporting the paths for this sort of work. Um, you can do it, but I think that the VCarve interface is a lot more intuitive. And I've been working with the guys um, at Cara, at Makera, with Josh and the team, to send them the files that are being spit out by vCarve um, and then the results that are coming out of the Carvera controller to help them to make sure that everything runs smoothly along that toolpath, um, along that work, that work path, because the initial outputs that I did uh, because of the controller and uh, because of the G-code encoding um, wasn't functioning properly, but they have since patched the application and uploaded that um, and so this is running the latest version of the controller application, and it does work great with vCarve now, um, thanks to their quick fixing of those problems. And this is just an example of something. I actually got a, uh, a scanner, I think it's called an Einstar, um, and it's a Chinese-made uh, 3D scanner that um, I've used to scan in the details of one of our rabbit plushes. Um, into into this data format um, that could be read by vCarve and then from vCarve output it to G-code. And so I've actually been able to, you know, sort of engrave a 3D relief of my own uh, data from from that scanning device to the, uh, the CNC machine here. So that was, that was kind of fun. And thus far, I've been doing all of my uh, kind of experiments and stuff in this high density foam. I think that's what it's called. Um, it's sort of like a stand in for wood. It's quite hard, um, but it's, it carves very easily and smoothly. And I've just been cutting pieces off of that on the, uh, the, the shop bandsaw here to make, uh, make little, little sample material work pieces that I can do some of these tests in. So this stuff is, um, is pretty great. It's very dense. It's very hard. Uh, but it's, I think, relatively easy for the machine to cut through, and you can get it in a variety of colors, pink. Um, this is kind of a wood simulation texture, but uh, I find that this stuff is really nice to work with and very easy to clean up. Now, this is the Z-Probe. Uh, the machine comes with two of them, and uh, you can see that by default, uh, it's all straight and unbent. Uh, how did I manage to bend mine? Well, the uh, material that I was working with uh, was quite a small piece of uh, kind of some of the scrap that was left over from one of the example projects. And the Z-probe came over to where that was situated on the bed here, and it wasn't able to come up high enough off of that uh, before it made a subsequent move, and it actually ended up scraping across the material, which bent this, uh, what would you call that? I guess you'd call that the shank or the... I'm not sure, but it doesn't want to focus on that. Anyway, it bent it, and um, fortunately, these can be removed. Um, as you can see, this has been unscrewed from the, the back of the probe, um, and because there are two of them, you can just steal one 
from probe A and stick it into probe B. Uh, Josh said they'll send out some replacements for these. I was also thinking since they're pretty simple, I could just lathe it up if I needed to, but uh, since he's going to send replacements, perhaps that's not necessary. Okay, so how did I crash the Z probe and how do you avoid doing that? Well, this is the little piece that I was uh, doing my tests on and um, like I said, this comes from the scrap of one of the examples, so it's very narrow and um, that's fine except that I allowed for the auto leveling feature to remain on when this process began and if you take a look at the steps that this goes through in terms of where the where the machining is done you'll notice that what is spit out in the g-code um, is tool movement that goes beyond the boundary of the material and of course the machine doesn't know where the material ends and begins and only knows the tool paths that are fed to it via the g-code and so the way that the auto leveling works is that it picks points along the path of the tool and it drops the z-probe down here 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 like that uh, so what happened was my z-probe ran along this edge uh, on the side here and it followed the contour of the toolpath. Uh, it got all the way down to the end here. As soon as it got to the end and decided it was gonna move over to do the, the probing in the center of the material, that uh, probe end did not rise up high enough uh, versus the surface material here. And so it crashed into the side of the material and it bent the Z-probe. In terms of strategies on how you could avoid crashing a Z-probe Z um, like I did, one of the things you can do is turn off auto leveling. Uh, when it comes to a smaller piece or a piece which is relatively flat already, um, the other thing you can do in here is you could adjust the clearance height to be a bit higher off of the, the initial surface. Um, and then one of the things that Josh said that he and, their, and the team do, they actually mill with a finger on the stop, the e-stop button here, so that on the first job um, you could be watching, of course that's just on the first pass, uh, you could be watching as it does the the auto leveling, uh, keep a thumb here and if it looks like the probe is diving down you know below uh, the material, the general material height um, as it's going along and it's going to crash when it comes back across, then you can stop it before any of that happens. Now, I saw it probing kind of low, but I didn't know enough to think that it wasn't going to, I didn't know that it wasn't going to rise up above the material high enough to avoid crashing. Um, so I wasn't able to really stop that before it had already happened. And then the last idea for avoiding that potential problem is just maybe, you know, don't mill material that's quite um, as thin as this. Again, I did that because it was scrap and because I was just sort of running an experiment, but if um, I was gonna do that again in the future, you know, I probably start with a larger piece of material and I would input an offset for the work to begin a little bit further in. That way it's got enough clearance all the way around for the, the auto leveling to function without crashing the probe. Now I mentioned that I've been using the machine a little bit now and using vCarve and so I'll just walk you through really quick like how easy it is to set something up. This is a wooden key kind of key holder tag whatever so like my scooter keys here um, they're blank you buy these on Taobao they cost next to nothing. Um, what's what's the process for carving uh, a name or words into this into this type of material? So first thing, you know, just get some dimensions off of this thing. Uh, it's going to be 30 uh, wide, uh, 30 deep by, um, what is that, uh, 54 wide. And then we also want to measure how thin or thick this material is. 54 by 30. And you can set your start position, uh, resolution. This is useful if you're doing the 3D modeling, which we're not doing today. We're just going to do some basic lettering here and you go in here and drop some text so we're going to say ajm scooter keys there we go 
and center that. And then you go over here to your toolpaths tab and you tell it you want to do some V carving. So <clears throat> select this and select a tool. So I've already put the tools in here. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, the manual, when you install, it's got some of this information in there. Also on the tools themselves, um, this information, but in terms of diameter, the degree, of uh, the angle on the tool, um, flute diameter, all those kinds of things. You put those in there. Uh, again, spindle speed, these are inside the instruction manual. And you can mess around with these uh, as needed until you tune it to where you want it to be. But yeah, this is just going to use the engraving tip. And I've also got this set up, you can see here, tool number two. Uh, the tool selection between different tools does work. On this job, we're only going to use one tool. But I have run other jobs where I first carved out a pocket with one of the, uh, one of the other bits first, um, and then had it go in there and use this engraving bit for some of the other cuts that it made. So you select that, you ask it to calculate the path, and then you can get a little 3D view here uh, of what that looks like. All right, and then you can do a preview here and see how it's, uh, it's going to cut that out, what that's going to look like in the final version. Um, pretty straightforward. So from there, you simply save your file. And uh, this is important, which post processor you use. We went a back and forth on a couple of different options, but what's working right now is G-code ATC arcs in millimeter, because I'm in China. Your mileage may, or your kilometers may vary, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, but yeah, we're just going to save out that one visible tool, tool path. And this is just a folder on my network drive where I'm saving all this kind of stuff. So we can say keychain uh, engrave. And then we go to the workshop and uh, we will see that this folder, this file is there as well. Okay, so the keychain wood bit is secured here to the work surface. Uh, I like these um, little slidey fixture doohickeys. I'm not sure what you call those exactly, but um, they are affixed to the work table and then they've got an adjuster slide um, that can come in here and hold a piece of work in place. Normally I'd want to maybe do uh, in both directions, but this is in there really strong and um, not a lot of force is going to be put on this part as it's milling, so I'm not too worried about just having it stuck in there like that. It's not, it's not going anywhere. So here on my laptop in the workshop, uh, you can see that this carving file, the tap file, is now on my network drive, so I'm just dragging it to the desktop here. And then the process for starting work on something like this is you need to go into this file selector menu, and you need to tell it you want to upload a new file to the machine. And so you do that by going to your desktop here, it's where I'm saving my these files temporarily, um, selecting that and then telling that to upload, because you want to upload that tap file to the machine itself to the Carvera. And once that's done, you close this dialog and then you still need to come here and you need to select that keychain engrave. This is now browsing the memory on the SD, SD card inside of the, the Carvera. So you select that and that'll load it into the interface you can see here. And then from there, you simply select that you want to start the job. Now this goes back to what we were talking about before uh, in terms of origin, start origin and margin scanning and all of this. Um, I'm going to leave the start origin still at zero zero because this is a relatively small piece and there's not a lot of room for, for wiggling around. Um, scan margin is good because you'll notice that the little laser probe uh, is going to go around the outside of the work area and you can kind of use that as a sanity check to determine whether or not it's going to be trying to mill outside of the area where you expect it to be milling. Now the Z-probe can be left on. Uh, I mentioned this in the, in the last video, I kind of got this wrong because I saw that it picked up the probe and went out and got a reading. Um, that is not the same as leveling, it's just finding where the Z, you know, where the Z is on the, on the material that you've set in there. And that's okay to have um, a little bit off center from the, the beginning work area. That's what this uh, red dot is here. And then as I mentioned, we don't need auto leveling on this piece, it's a flat piece, and we don't want to crash the uh, the probe. So with all that done, click Run. So 
So it's going to drop the tool that it was using on the previous job and it's going to pick up the Z probe and then it's going to come over here and do a Z probe um, 5 5 from the origin. And then once that's done, it's going to go back over there and pick up that V bit again and then bring it over here to do its work. So close the lid there. Closing the lid does make a very big uh, impact on the amount of sound that this machine puts out. I can tell you that this is uh, in the basement of my house. Um, it's next to what we call our theater room. It's where, where we watch movies and stuff. Um, outside of this workshop, you cannot hear this machine running. It's super, super quiet. And so I think that the guys did a really good job on soundproofing and insulating this thing um, so that, you know, if you have it in a home workshop, you're not going to be bugging the neighbors with it. can see the red laser dot on there it's doing the scan around the area on the material where the work is going to take place so you saw how it kept it you know offset in the center of that piece of wood that's good it's where we want it to do its work and now it's coming down to do its Z probe and that's it successful Z probing without crashing the probe I might add Alright, it's picked up the V-bit engraving, and uh, well, it's going to go and get a sense of the length of that bit. And then come back over here and commence work. job is finished so we send it back over to its home position and we can have a look here at how that turned out. Look at that. Easy peasy. Turned out all right. Uh, probably picked a font a little bit smaller than was comfortable for that size of, uh, of wood. Um, but uh, anyway, that kind of gives you a sense of just how quick the path is from designing something to carving something. Uh, there was a comment on the YouTube channel asking how big the work bed itself is. Um, so it's 240 uh, in this direction and it's three, uh, 350 across here. Now, I don't know how much of the last 50 of that is usable because the tool changing home here and this uh, sort of I don't know what exactly that is, but anyway, sort of protective curtain bumper or something. Um, it does take up, you know, a good uh, one cm of space there. So I'm assuming that if you try to carve all the way over to that side, you might bump into that, which may not be a problem, but um, something to be aware of. So yeah, it's 240 uh, by, you know, 350, but inside the safe zone, maybe 300. Now I haven't had much time to do much beyond crash the Z-probe and a couple of those little basic carving projects like I showed you, uh, but my next ambition is to get this fourth axis installed and combine that with some of the data that we're getting from the 3D scanner that I mentioned and see if we can't cut some of our own fourth axis 3D models on this machine. So uh, next time I drop a video, hopefully it will be on that topic. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, comments and questions uh, down below and uh, see you next time.